Coming up this March, in a newly emerging capital of big-time boxing, a bout between Anthony Joshua and Francis Ngannou will capture the world's attention in a way few fights can. It's really quite an amazing time we're living in for combat sports and I'm, I'm excited to see this. But whilst this crossover boxing trend may feel like a recent phenomenon, the what-if questions involving different combat sport disciplines are in fact a 100-year-old tradition. Between wrestling legend Ed Strangler Lewis and boxing elite Jack Dempsey, to the mixed rules contests of the 1960s and 70s that laid the groundwork for MMA, fans have consistently shown a keen interest in discovering the outcomes of matchups between boxers and opponents from different fighting styles. But we know the danger that he brings, the mental strength that he brings, and the size. The upcoming Joshua vs Ngannou showdown will attract huge excitement and attention and continue the discourse on how an MMA fighter can cope with the intricacies of professional boxing. 30 seconds, come on. Come on, keep those back. Appropriately nicknamed the Predator, Francis Ngannou's new hunting ground has put him on a path of lucrative encounters never before possible. And in theory, the brawler holds many of the traits required to succeed in the sport, none more noticeable than his phenomenal punching power. But despite the general intrigue his abilities have garnered, the decision to select him as Anthony Joshua's next opponent has understandably fueled the debate about the integrity of boxing, with many arguing the matchup prioritizes money and entertainment over skill and fair competition. But the legs are betraying him, and down he goes. Whether it does indeed devalue the sweet science or draw new eyeballs to a storied old sport, in this episode, we zone in specifically on one of the participants to recapture perhaps the most remarkable personal journey of an athlete today. An almost mythical underdog story, which even the most cynical of viewers can root for. Oh, man, you got too much power to punch like that. And only in boxing, with its unpredictable nature, can a profession leave just enough room for an underdog to cause a seismic upset? You're talking about a guy that has so much resilience, that has so much willpower and strength to succeed. That's what makes him dangerous. As was certain to happen, the decision from Anthony Joshua to face Francis Ngannou has been met with stern criticism by fans from both sides of the boxing and MMA divide. This is a cash grab, let's be honest. It's not a world title fight. It's not proper heavyweight boxing. What's he, what's he... The motives of Joshua, who still remains a powerhouse of a name in the sport, are crystal clear. And the temptations to take advantage of a sizable payday were no doubt too strong to resist. There is the argument of what this fight does for us. We know financially it's great, we know it excites the fans, but we got At the time of the fight's making, all of the box office matchups within the sport were out of the Britain's grasp. His original opponent for the upcoming March 8th date, Deontay Wilder, suffered a disappointing points loss to diminish whatever hopes remained of their hugely popular fight. Meanwhile, the world's title holders of the division, Alexander Usyk and Tyson Fury, were already committed to an undisputed meeting. And whilst this has left Joshua with the option of fighting Filip Hergovic for what will be a vacated IBF world's title later this year, there still remains the pressing need to keep occupied with a fight before the summer. And in a hustling industry where relevancy is key, no ordinary fight will suffice. Instead, it requires an attention-grabbing announcement to quench the thirst of the Middle Eastern brokers willing to pay another astronomical sum to host a live heavyweight event. There will never be a better moment than now for Joshua's team to select MMA sensation Francis Ngannou for their novelty crossover boxing match. The Cameroonian is currently basking in the absolute peak of his fame and popularity and has seen his fortunes transform in the most unimaginable ways. 
His heroics against Tyson Fury just three months earlier have now piqued the interest of a credulous fight audience that believes similar success can be seized against other heavyweights in the sport. You're going to make so much money in boxing, yeah. and I think he might be able to beat them all. I think he's that good. And whilst far-fetched in its thinking, it comes as no surprise considering the fairy tale journey that Francis Ngannou has already made into reality. For people that don't already know, it's not like you can just jump on a plane and come no, to the no, US no. and start training and then you turn into who you are. <laughs> they make a whole background check, you yeah. know, they investigate everything in your life, your family, uh, because they don't want you to come here with your misery. Born in the village of Bati in Western Cameroon, the life of Francis Ngannou and his four siblings began with the same disruption that would later plague his adult years. Moving from house to house, village to village and relative to relative, the young boy finally found a semblance of stability when, at the age of nine, he began working in sand mines for less than two dollars a day. Even those who care couldn't do anything. So the situation there was so miserable. My mom was always there, but Sometimes she was just powerless. It was also the same time in which his nation was gripped with the fever of the 1994 World Cup, hosted by none other than the United States, a metropolitan oasis in a far distant land. And it would be here that a young Francis Ngannou through a small television screen would be exposed to bright lights, action movies, fast cars, and a cosmos of never-ending opportunities. I remember like being a child, I kind of like have a virtual war in my mind. Like when it was so hard for me, I could escape and go take a time, go in that room who was just in my mind, virtual, and he was so perfect, good enough to escape. By the age of 13, Nganu was able to produce the same work as a grown man. The monotony of the sand mines seemed to multiply his muscles as he shot up to an imposing six foot four figure when he turned 17. His confidence grew, and a conscious decision to stop thinking of himself as a victim began to foster. And remembering his father's reputation as a violent street fighter, a passion for boxing was pursued in the hope of one day reaching America and becoming a heavyweight superstar. But the years were passing, and Nganu still remained in the village. He turned 20, the age's hero Mike Tyson became heavyweight champion of the world. He then turned 22, the age Muhammad Ali achieved the same. And finally, in April of 2012, an impatient 25 years old Francis Ngannou bid farewell to his family to set out on a treacherous journey across the continent to realize his dream. The deserts, mountains and forests all became an opponent to outwit and conquer. Through bribes, fake passports and hitchhiking rides, it took three weeks, 3,000 miles and four countries to reach his first major milestone, Morocco, the closest region to Europe and a boiling pot of like-minded travelers hoping to slip through. Many migrants using dinghies have often made the dangerous journey from Morocco into Spain. But this week, an influx of at least 8,000 people was unusually high, threatening a humanitarian crisis. The odds were stacked against him. Countless bodies had been lost in the 1,200 feet of unforgiving waters that separated the two continents. Each of his six painstaking attempts to cross were met with six soul-destroying failures resulting in a Moroccan jail or being thrown back out to an open desert. It was enough to make any man, even one as strong-willed as Nganu, reconsider his choices. But the idea of returning to his village to face more pain and mockery was inconceivable. And his seventh and final attempt to cross the divide was executed with a military-like zeal to finally make it ashore, where, despite being thrown in a Spanish prison for two months, his false identification prevented the authorities from deporting him. Upon immediate release, the Cameroonian wasted no time in fair dodging his way onto a train and making it to his next destination, France. 
and there, in the bustling city of Paris, his formal education into combat sports would finally begin. Upon his immediate arrival, Nganu turned up unannounced at a boxing gym, patiently waiting for head coach Didier Camon to finish his class before introducing himself. Camon noticed the tall, robustly built figure, and something in the way the stranger carried himself prevented the coach from dismissing him. Ngano himself remained guarded, slow to reveal the details of his personal story and fearful of anyone getting too close too soon. But Camon's kindness and generosity relieved some of his loneliness and gave him a glimpse of a possible community. A sanctuary was provided in which the African could learn his craft, and Camon went further by offering him housing in a rented apartment to replace the cold parking lot where Nganu had been spending his nights. But despite this brief stroke of luck, Paris soon confronted Nganu with the harsh reality that pursuing a professional boxing career at his age was uncertain, particularly in a country with limited opportunities. And with the boxing gym temporarily closed, Camon suggested mixed martial arts as an alternative option, which Nganu reluctantly considered as a means to stay in shape. At a gym called the MMA Factory, he encountered Fernand Lopez, who was all too delighted to take such a physical specimen under his wing. Though it was a strange discipline, Nganu found joy in the dynamic kicks and action-packed style reminiscent of his childhood Hollywood movies. And within a month, Lopez, convinced of Nganu's potential, arranged his first professional bout in November 2013 under a French promotional outfit. Securing a submission win against Rashid Benzina marked his initial foray into the sport. But it was a loss in his second bout that unintentionally compelled him to persist in the field. Like the other setbacks in his life, the defeat exerted a magnetic pull, akin to a distant shore, making it impossible for him to abandon his newest pursuit. 20 years prior to this, in the dusty sand mines of Cameroon, began a young boy's dream of reaching the bright lights of America. And by December of 2015, the boy had morphed into a destructive knockout machine to earn a contract with the biggest and most powerful promotional company in the sport, the UFC. Ladies and gentlemen, this fight is three rounds in the UFC heavyweight division. Carrying a momentum of four consecutive stoppage victories, the new UFC prospect debuted with a monstrous uppercut to demonstrate his frightening potential. Living up to the nickname, the Predator landed on new territory to launch a destructive 12-month campaign, with not a single opponent making it past the second round. Oh, it got him! Knocks Orlovsky down! That is it! By 2017, Nganu had rocketed up the rankings and positioned himself to face Alistair Overeem, one of the most decorated fighters to ever fight in the UFC's heavyweight fold. The Dutchman, a former Strike Force champion, brought extensive experience with 60 professional MMA bouts since his debut in 1999. Nganu, meanwhile, began training only in August of 2013 and now, barely four years later, was standing on the edge of a UFC heavyweight title shot. Francis Ngannou with an opportunity to join that mix tonight. But being touted as the sport's best heavyweight prospect in a long time, the Cameroonian quickly validated the acclaim by unleashing a devastating left uppercut to render the veteran unconscious. Get a match up with Ngannou! Goes the ring! Francis Ngannou! The victory was met with widespread acclaim, 
signaling the emergence of a new and dynamic power-punching force in the sport. That's what we were talking about, ladies and gentlemen. But the competitive reality of a highly skilled industry would immediately set in, reminding fans that becoming a world champion was no easy feat. While Francis Ngannou was poised to one day take the division by storm, the then UFC champion Stipe Miocic thwarted his world title aspirations by utilizing his superior wrestling to neutralize Ngannou's ungodly punching power and keep the challenger on his back for five rounds to successfully retain the heavyweight crown. And the harsh lessons from the sport's Premier League of Fighters didn't end there, as the subsequent bout saw Nganu drop to a second consecutive loss in an underwhelming five-round bout against Derek Lewis. 2018 was proving to be the most challenging period of his professional journey thus far, but being no stranger to stumbling blocks, the Cameroonian regrouped to stamp the year's end with a signature stoppage win against Curtis Blades. Oh! Over the top with a right hand! 2019 then saw further dominant victories over Cain Velasquez and Junior Dos Santos, with the latter reminding why so many fans first regarded him as a must-see attraction. And in 2020, after overcoming numerous COVID-19 postponements, the UFC rewarded Nganu with a world title eliminator against undefeated prospect Gersinio Rosenstrike, whose fine run of form could do nothing to withstand a lethal left hook to send him crashing against the cage. Oh! It's all Rosenstrike is out! Whoa! Nganu! Oh, man! At just 20 seconds into the first round, this not only marked the quickest knockout of Nganu's career, but also a clear signal of intent for his rematch against the UFC heavyweight champion, Stipe Miocic. But, uh, you know, he's definitely gotten better. You know, we all evolved and he's definitely evolved. And oh, of course I knew I'd probably see him down the road again. And... Their highly anticipated rematch took place in March of 2021. And three years on from their initial encounter, Ngano instantly showed that he had learned the valuable lessons to mount a tougher challenge. After dropping the champion with a stiff jab, Ngannou resumed the onslaught to end the fight with another devastating left hook. The Predator moniker had been resurrected to usher a new era in the UFC heavyweight scene. Typically, the crowning of a new dominant UFC champion is followed by a stable reign of title defenses and exciting matchups. But feeling confined by the UFC's rigid contract structure, a growing sense of resentment instead brewed within the Cameroonian star, who noticed the stark contrast in financial compensation compared to his boxing counterparts. You don't need me to introduce the WBC World Heavyweight Champion defending the title. In the time their heavyweight champion, Tyson Fury, was earning $25 million against Deontay Wilder, Nganu received a meager sum of $600,000 for his title victory against Miocic. In the past two years, I fought twice, and then uh, I have to borrow money to live. Nobody cares about that. I have no guarantee in that deal and I have no prediction. So based on that experience, I want to get something better, a better time on my contract. Heading into his first title defense, Nganu's existing contract was set to expire, therefore necessitating the urgent negotiation of a new agreement with the UFC. But fully aware of his worth, the champion not only insisted on improving financial terms, but also the independence to pursue opportunities with his primary passion, boxing. But even if or when the USA and I, we, we finalize it here, the boxing uh, part has to be into it because I can't see myself retire without boxing. This request, however, would be flatly rejected by the company, who couldn't allow a champion in his prime any time away from their sport. Instead, their counter-offer, a reported $8 million to face fellow star John Jones, was put forth only to again be met with Nganu's refusal. We, we offered Francis a deal that would have made him the highest paid heavyweight in the history of the company. More than Lesnar, more than anybody. 
um, and he turned the deal down. The deal's additional caveats, including contract extensions, restrictions on outside sponsors, and lack of health insurance for less privileged fighters, led to its rejection. Nganu's courage to remain defiant against a powerful corporate entity earned praise initially, but as the months of inactivity went by, industry opinions shifted, accusing him of overplaying his hand and harming his career. But an undeterred Nganu, much like when the villagers scoffed at his young boy dreams, remained determined to prove the naysayers wrong. And in May of 2023 came the shock revelation that the former UFC heavyweight champion had signed a groundbreaking contract with rival promoter PFL. I chose the PFL out of everyone in order to change the game of MMA. For whoever feel ready, I'm the baddest mother on the planet. Since 2018, the Professional Fighters League, backed by powerful investors, has emerged as a significant player in MMA, aiming to challenge the UFC's market dominance. And with their most prominent signing to date, have honoured Nganu's request for improved pay for all PFL fighters, as well as providing a minimum $2 million purse for all of his future opponents specifically. But the bonuses didn't end there as the organization would commit further by placing Nganu as chairman of the promotion's latest expansion, PFL Africa. And the final concession, which perhaps delighted the Cameroonian the most, was the independence to pursue his ambition in boxing. The timing of Nganu's campaign into boxing could not have come at a more appropriate time, as by now a new dynamic force in the sport had taken form. Football, F1, boxing, golf, it's just some of the sports that Saudi Arabia has heavily invested in. It's threatening to change sport as we know it. I see it that we're playing our role to develop sports within, within the world and to be part of the international community. Saudi Arabia, with lofty expectations for its Vision 2030 project, is currently recruiting the most influential people in boxing to stage its most in-demand matchups. And specifically, the heavyweight division is a prime target of interest, having already hosted two blockbuster title fights. Their intentions this time around, however, sought to stretch the norms by hosting a novelty crossover match between Francis Ngannou and the WBC world champion Tyson Fury. As was to be expected, the announcement drew waves of criticism from both fans and media, mainly in the direction of Tyson Fury, who was seen to be delaying his undisputed showdown with Alexander Usyk in favour of an easy exhibition bout over a novice boxer. I'm disappointed to see the WBC champion of the world fighting in an exhibition fight. The whole thing's a money grab, total mismatch. Good luck to him, but it is what it is. Very few gave the Cameroonian any hope of being competitive, let alone winning. But from Nganu's perspective, the lifelong dream of competing in high-profile boxing bouts was finally being realised. And despite Fury's world title not being on the line, the occasion itself represented the phenomenal journey of a poverty-stricken boy now earning multi-million dollar paydays on the grandest of stages. From the moment that he get announced officially that I'm fighting Tyson Fury, man, one more, this is real. Just live the dream. It was amazing. Unbeknownst to those in attendance and the millions watching at home, the mind-blowing opening ceremony and the sheer spectacle of the event could only be matched by Nganu's audacious plot to upset the odds. I think Tyson puts Nganu to sleep. I think he could probably do it whenever he wanted to, but I'll say I'll go five, maybe six. And whether it was genuine ignorance or pure arrogance, or a combination of both, the overwhelming majority of boxing observers ignored the fact that the Cameroonian's primary trade was always boxing. And a surprisingly adept in Ghanu came out of the blocks with impressive form and technique, to the extent that a well-placed left hook in the third round sent the WBC champion crashing to the canvas. The self-proclaimed king of the heavyweights, Tyson Fury, was more shocked than anyone else in the arena as panic struck in him and his corner team to regain control of the fight. Seven more competitive rounds ensued 
as the champion boxer struggled to assert his supposed superiority. And by the time the fight saw the final bell, the boxing world shuddered in anticipation of the result, which narrowly went in favor of Tyson Fury to preserve his undefeated status. The Gypsy King, Tyson Fury! I thought that Francis Ngannou won that fight. I think Tyson Ooh. maybe overlooked him. We all thought Francis was going to come and swing. He fought beautifully at times. To echo the words of veteran broadcaster Larry Merchant, Fury won the fight, but Ngannou won the event. I thought he put an incredible performance in, but for me, Francis Ngannou won that fight. If it wasn't already clear to Ngannou's former associates at the UFC, his audacity to stand tall and reject their demands was paying off multiple times over. The MMA fighter's unearthly power had now crept its way into boxing to cause an unprecedented ripple effect in which previously fantasized matchups were becoming genuine possibilities. There'll be no trouble to make Ngannou Joshua. Ngannou, you know, all of them. Talks of fighting fellow titans Deontay Wilder and Anthony Joshua began circulating as it became clear that Ngannou's return to the MMA world would be temporarily paused. We didn't know if this was going to be a one-off exhibition match. No, 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 no. Well, I really want to come and reinstall it and make things right and get my victory. And just two months later, at Saudi Arabia's next heavyweight bonanza, Deontay Wilder put himself out of contention with a surprise loss against Joseph Parker, which left only Anthony Joshua as the prime candidate for Ngannou's next shock opponent. Doing it the difficult way, going through obstacles and what some might call immovable objects. In this man to my left, the giant of a man, the former UFC heavyweight world champion, but now a guy that we take very, very seriously in the sport of boxing. Much like the Fury matchup, the decision to pit two-time world champion Anthony Joshua against a fighter plying the majority of his trade in MMA has been met with strong objection. The former Olympic gold medalist brings with him 17 years worth of boxing experience at the highest level. Along the way, he's competed with a multitude of past and present world champions to produce what is currently the most stacked heavyweight resume in the sport. Lift off for AJ! And the incredibly high standards the British superstar has set for himself unfortunately places him at the forefront of any criticism should he divert from the conventional matchmaking expected of him. Who Anthony Joshua said he don't do gimmick fights. Eddie Hearn said it was a money grab when Frank Warren announced it. Oh, how they both get on so well now, don't they? But Francis Ngannou's exploits against Tyson Fury have sparked an unavoidable intrigue that promoters can't not exploit. The fierce punching abilities exhibited in the MMA world imply a slightly smoother transition into boxing than that of a typical mixed martial artist. And given Anthony Joshua's previous track record of tasting the canvas in a shock stoppage loss, Ngannou's game plan will be abundantly clear. Yes, I heard that he does have a chin. I don't know if it's true or not. I'm going to fight him, so what do you think I'm going to do? Is to find, look for his chin. I mean, that's what happened in the fight. The sheer chaos of an MMA combatant inflicting a monstrous upset defeat on an elite level boxer may sound appeasing to the neutral fight fan. But boxing doesn't always lend itself to such imaginative scenarios, and the far more likely outcome of the more skilled and refined combatant emerging victorious is too prevalent to ignore. The element of surprise which Ngannou enjoyed in his last outing has now been removed. And in Anthony Joshua, he faces an opponent that will be far more prepared for his disguised boxing abilities. Joshua. Stylistically, Joshua also presents a challenge which Fury couldn't mount, namely a powerful offensive range, which can prove deadly against a novice with an uneducated boxing defense. Well, Joshua let him off the but whatever the intricate fight analysis and where one stands on the ethical components of this matchup, there is no denying the profound spectacle of two well-sculpted giants trading leather in the middle of a ring. An unmissable sight that is certain to catch the attention of both the hardcore combat fans 
as well as the casual viewer.